My name is Alex Meissner, and our laboratory, which is located at Harvard University's Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology, as well as the Broad Institute, um, has a particular interest in mechanisms of epigenetic regulation in stem cells and reprogramming. When we're looking at normal development, we're particularly fascinated by the zygote and how a single genome can give rise to hundreds of cell types, trillions of different cells with fates that are as diverse as the neuron or lymphocyte shown here. And so classically, cellular identity has been defined using functional phenotypic or developmental readouts. Over the past decade, we and many others have extended these empirical definitions using transcriptional chromatid data to come up with a more precise molecular state description. Now, this becomes very powerful when looking into the possibilities of changing cellular identities and also very important towards guiding the process um, towards the defined targets as well as characterizing the eventual cell types being created. Nuclear transfer was first used to demonstrate that differentiation is not a unidirectional process. And while being very exciting, it has a number of technical challenges that are hard to overcome. So the emergence of ectopic transcription factor expression as a tool to convert one cell type into an alternative um, has been very exciting. And again, the major difference here is this is able, we are able to do this on large populations of cells um, and therefore can do systematic biochemical um, as well as genomic characterization. To follow on this idea that we can effectively convert now any cell type, for example, into a pluripotent cell, also comes with a challenge that we need to characterize the actual cells that we're creating. And that's a problem that remains over time as we're actually growing these cells. It will be a continuous challenge to control the quality and the differentiation potential of the cells. To further illustrate this, there are currently about 300 human embryonic stem cell lines on the NIH registry. There are thousands of publications using iPS cell lines, and there are many large-scale projects going on to produce um, iPS cells. But in particular, one point to notice is that now with advanced genome editing technologies such as the CRISPR-Cas9 systems, we can also use many of the existing cell lines and start to introduce many different mutations, genomic changes, um, that all again raise the question on what the phenotypic consequences are on the cells. And to illustrate this with a real example from our lab, we were particularly interested in um, the DNA method transferases, and so similar to mouse experiments that had been done before, we deleted DMT3A, 3B, or both enzymes in human embryonic stem cells. Now, in the mouse, the phenotype is either early embryonic or postnatal lethal. In human, of course, we cannot do these in vivo experiments, and so the first pass molecular characterization clearly showed that the deletion, for instance, of 3A essentially blocks all the novomethylation that normally occurs during the differentiation towards endoderm. But in order to study further the phenotype, we use the teratoma assay, and as you can see um, from these sections, all knockouts, the single or the double knockouts, can still differentiate into three, all three embryonic germ layers. Now this, again, come, brings me back to the point of asking the particular question of, do I even have a pluripotent cell line? But then more specifically, we and many others, of course, are interested in how well does the particular line differentiate. And then, as I just showed you in the last example, uh, what are the effects of perturbations, whether these are small molecules, knockdowns, or knockouts? So again, the classic assay um, would be, for instance, the teratoma assay, as shown on the right here, and this one cell line that stains positive for most of the um, stem cell markers, as well as forms a teratoma and has a normal carrier type. However, the typical representation is not very quantitative, so we wanted to see if we can actually make this um, more powerful by 
more comprehensively counting the contribution to the germlase in the teratoma. And so what's shown here is, again, a section where we now use a pathologist to assign cell types to the different germ layers. And then we're actually counting the nuclei falling within each one of these in multiple sections. We can also validate, of course, the assignment using antibody stainings for particular markers representative of certain germ layers. Uh, the outcome is, in fact, very disappointing. If you actually take the same cell line inject it now in parallel into three different mice to create independent teratomas. And then you do the section and the counting of a large number of nuclei, you can see that there's a huge variation in terms of the contribution to each germ layer. So for instance, the first teratoma, you can see almost equal representation of ectoderm and mesoderm, but very little endoderm. However, in the second one, you can now see that there's a lot more ectoderm compared to the other, which are more similar to each other in terms of numbers. And then the third one is again different, where again you see more mesoderm now than ectoderm and a much larger number of, um, smaller number of endoderm cells, suggesting that overall, based on this result, it's very difficult to come to a quantitative conclusion on whether or not this particular cell line differentiates into any one of these germ layers preferentially. If you then try to go deeper, and um, trying to see whether now our sectioning was just not representative and you actually section the teratoma in different planes and then count the nuclei there, again, the result is equally disappointing in a sense that there's a lot of variation even within the same teratoma. Now, given that counting nuclei might be limited, um, we also cut thicker sections and actually isolated RNA, did expression profiling, but as shown here, using the clustering, no clear pattern emerges that would actually separate out the individual teratomas as consistent. And so just to conclude on what we can use this assay for, the teratoma assay is costly and time-consuming, but it can be used, of course, to confirm the basic concept of pluripotency because we could clearly show all of our cell lines that we tested differentiate into all three germ layers. But it's also worth noting that it's a highly variable assay, and as I showed you, it's very difficult to quantify the actual differentiation into the germ layers. Now, as an alternative, we've been very interested over the last few years to look at the um, possibility of using gene expression signatures to predict the differentiation potential of cell lines. And so in general, one can assume that the marker expression as well as the differentiation is, in fact, the result of coordinated gene expression changes. And so we can then use these um, gene expression signatures and hope that these would provide reproducible and quantitative comparable results um, that could be used across different labs and platforms. Now, this assay should be very simple, and so we've spent some time developing a way of actually using random EB differentiation followed by qPCR um, to characterize, again, these expression signatures. Now, this particular signature panel that I'll briefly discuss today um, contains 96 genes. It's on the TACMAN qPCR um, platform and is available by Life Technologies or now Thermo Fisher. And so I won't have time to run through all the different genes on the platform, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of key concepts. So first, of course, the panel contains a number of control genes that should be largely invariant across the differentiation. And as you can see here from the RNA-seq, across the directed differentiation as well as the EB differentiation um, for two different time points, you can clearly see that um, invariant expression. Then, and that's worth highlighting, we only include a fairly small panel of um, genes that are um, expressed in pluripotent cells um, and generally become downregulated in the directed um, or EB differentiation. And so the main rationale here is that the assay isn't um, designed to measure the molecular signature of pluripotency, but rather be used as a way to characterize the functional pluripotency which is, in fact, the execution of the pluripotency program towards the three embryonic germ layers. And so the panel is highly specific for um, genes that tend to be expressed um, in the three embryonic germ layers rather than in the pluripotent state. 
just to highlight one particular example, so this shows you the mesoderm-related genes. As you can see in the RNA sequencing, um, that uh, in particular in the mesoderm you see upregulation of these particular of these genes, um, and you can see during the EB differentiation um, induction of most of them. Now those results were initially derived using one embryonic stem cell line, Hu64, but we also in this shown on the scatter plot verified that the uniqueness of expression that we see here is generally representative of all other cell lines that were included. And that's indeed the case and confirmed by the tight correlation between the Hu64 and the general ES cell panel. We can then group the different genes into the categories as shown here, the pluripotent, the endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, and the control group. And then measure the expression at different time points, day two, day five, and day 12, as shown here. And then these measurements are actually compared towards a reference panel of a larger number of um, pluripotent stem cell lines. Now, some of the genes are differentially induced during the EB differentiation, and we can actually take this into account and add weight to our measurements. And by combining the gene expression measurements, the weights, um, we can derive the differentiation potential as well as the combined p-value that help us evaluate um, the pluripotency potential of these cells. This slide now shows a large panel of different human embryonic stem cells as well as iPS cell lines um, over time course of, again, day two, day five, and day 12. On the left side, we're plotting the differentiation potential. On the right side, the associated p-values. And so what you can clearly see is as the cells are differentiating, the pluripotency signatures are downregulated, and you see induction of all three germ layers, although to varying degrees um, across the different panels, but in all cases, it's a clear significant induction. So what are the applications um, for this type of platform? Well, as I introduced initially, of course, we thought about this as a way to characterize the derivation of pluripotent cells, and so an obvious um, test would be to um, see if we indeed reprogrammed our cells completely. Now, to do this on an extreme case, we selected partially reprogrammed um, cells and ran them on the scorecard assay. What you can clearly see across a number of these partial reprogrammed lines, all of them fail to score um, with significance within the range of pluripotent cells. The partial reprogrammed cells were, of course, more extreme examples. So to really highlight the power um, and quantitative nature of this platform, I want to use the following experiment, where we use directed differentiation towards the embryonic germ layers and in this particular example, towards endoderm. And so all of these usually require recombinant proteins or growth factors. And so here we tested the replacement of these using small molecules or other inhibitors to see if that quantitatively changes the differentiation potential. And so what you can very nicely see, swapping Win3A with lithium chloride doesn't impact um, the differentiation um, towards endoderm. Um, and so we actually routinely use now lithium chloride instead of Win3A. However, if you try other combinations, such as the IDE um, combined with the lithium chloride, you can see clearly a quantitative difference towards the endoderm um, germ layer. And so this really highlights how we can use the scorecard assay to quantitatively assess the differentiation towards a particular germ layer and then make meaningful decisions on the effectiveness of, in this case, small molecules or compounds. And sticking with this endoderm differentiation, I just want to use the um, following example to highlight another potential application of the, of the platform. And so during that differentiation that I just explained, again, in this case, using active A and lithium chloride, you initially um, create an, a mixture of um, endodermal cells that we can then usually um, further purify using the surface marker CD184. However, now to test whether or not this enrichment is indeed necessary and what it actually does, 
we ran these samples in the sorted and unsorted state on the scorecard platform. And so what you can very nicely see going from right to left, you can see the endoderm scores are not dramatically impacted um, as shown um, by the overlap of the black and the red dots. And so that suggests that in both cases, the majority of the cells are indeed endoderm. But what you can very nicely see is that the sorting depletes the mesoderm score, suggesting that there are some contaminating mesodermal cells within our population. Um, as you would expect, there's no change in ectoderm because these are not related differentiation um, protocols. But what you can also see now in the pluripotency, which is on the far left, you can see, um, again, a depletion, a clear depletion of the pluripotency um, score, which suggests that um, there are indeed undifferentiated cells that remain within this early differentiated cell population. And so, again, this very simple measurement now tells us that during the differentiation, if we don't sort um, for CD184, we have still some mesoderm as well as some pluripotency contamination in our cell um, type. Two more examples. Um, as I said, one interesting application of this assay could be to quantitatively measure the effects of perturbations, such as the knockout or knockdown of a gene. And so sometimes that comes with surprising outcomes where um, when we knocked down OTX2, we had expected some phenotypic differences in terms of the ectoderm differentiation where this um, transcription factor acts. And indeed, we do see some reduction of ectoderm differentiation once we knock down OTX2 as shown for three independent clones here. However, unexpectedly, we also saw a dramatic shift in terms of mesoderm markers coming on in the knockdown. And so again, this just highlights the power of looking at this um, using this um, three lineage um, differentiation assay. And to provide a last example, we frequently grow our cells either on feeder cells or on feeder free conditions. And so if you actually compare these conditions, which generally don't cause dramatic differences um, within the cells, um, we can actually see a very subtle change in the expression of endoderm and to some lesser degree for of mesoderm and ectoderm genes um, that tend to be more highly expressed on the cells when grown in feeders. And so that suggests that, again, growing cells in feeder cells may induce actually higher levels of background differentiation, which we're picking up using the signatures of the three embryonic germ layers shown here. What we can also see is that, indeed, when you're now using directed differentiation, Following the adaptation to feeder-free conditions, we see that overall the differentiation is slightly less efficient, but in fact more specific. So you get more targeted differentiation to your desired cell type. So to just summarize and conclude what I told you today about, I initially spent some time telling you about some results using both the classic as well as the more advanced way um, of looking at teratomas. And the main conclusion is that, indeed, it shows pluripotency of your cells, but it is also highly variable, very difficult to quantify, and also time-consuming as well as costly. You can then contrast that with what I told you about using the qPCR-based gene expression signatures. Um, and just beyond sort of the typical applications of measuring trilineage potential, in your pluripotent cells, I showed you a number of different um, applications that really depend on the more quantitative nature of this assay to determine the effects of small molecules or um, genetic perturbations. And so generally, we really can't see any cases or haven't found any case over the last few years um, where the gene expression signatures haven't told us um, m the same or actually more than we could have learned from a teratoma. And so one of these examples is indeed the DMT3A and B knockouts that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And so we did do the teratoma assay, but now I'm showing you on the left, we also did the scorecard, and both assays independently confirm and allow us to conclude that these cells still retain trilineage um, differentiation potential. And so what we're hoping with this, we're slowly getting more and more convinced that it's really no longer necessary to run the teratoma assay because it just doesn't tell you anything beyond 
where we can learn much faster and effective using other means. I showed you, I showed you a number of different examples of how one can apply these gene expression signatures to the characterization of cell lines. Um, but it's worth noting that this particular assay or the scorecard assay has been initially developed for the quantitative analysis of the trilineage differentiation potential. There are probably many other applications for using gene expression signatures, for instance, for more targeted cell types such as hepatocytes or different neural cell types. Um, that wouldn't be effectively measured by the current assay, but rather would require, again, going through a similar iterative design using initially deriving the specific signatures, creating reference panels, um, and then coming up with a final um, expression signature. But that should all be doable and suggest that, again, this could be a much more general way of trying to um, use molecular signatures um, to identify and characterize cell types. So with this, I just want to acknowledge the people driving these um, studies, in particular Alex and Veronica, shown here, some of our key collaborators, um, as well as the team of Life Technologies. I also want to thank the rest of the lab, our funding sources, and of course you for listening today. Thank you.